Hello, thanks for watching. Just before we start today's video, a very quick disclaimer. DSM 7.1 has been around now for a, more than half a year. I did a review for DSM 7 last year, and DSM 7.1 right now is what pretty much everyone has access to. But it should be highlighted that in a few months, uh, at least at the time of recording, DSM 7.2, at least in beta, is going to arrive. So although I have full intention to cover DSM 7.2, I thought it prudent for us to do a full review and overview of DSM 7.1 as it stands right now before I do a whole overview of DSM 7.2 with the update. So that's what this video is. If you watch my review of DSM 7, there's only a few extra things in this overview. But if you're new to Synology NAS or you're considering a Synology NAS for your next big uh, company or personal purchase, Definitely watch this video. I know it's a long one, but it's going to cover loads of the things that Synology and its software DSM can give you, both for good and sometimes for bad. Let's carry on with the start. Hello and welcome back to this, my review of DSM 7.1. Now, before we start today's video, there's a few things we got to get clear straight off the bat. Number one, we are running this on the new DS923+. Plus, But... The most, pretty much all of the features and services we're going to talk about today are possible with pretty much any Synology NAS. There are some exceptions, some more power user applications, some applications that require more powerful CPUs in order to get the job done. And when that is, when that is the case, I'll try and tell you. But this video is less about the hardware. This video is about us kind of really delving deep into DSM 7.1. And I'm going to try to cover pretty much all of the inbuilt applications. I'm going to go into more detail than on, on some than others, but I will try to include them all. Alongside that, I'm going to be utilizing a number of desktop client applications, which although you don't need to use in conjunction with your system, it's worth highlighting that sometimes you get a better experience if you use them alongside your NAS there. Another thing I will highlight as well is although I'm using the DS923+, Plus, I have upgraded the memory to 8 gig. The reason I've done that is because for all of the apps and services we're going to look at today, you're going to need a little bit more memory. You can get away with utilizing pretty much everything you're going to see today on the default 4 gig of memory, but what I will highlight is that if you do run it on that 4 gig, certain applications, when they are in their pumps, such as virtual machines and containers, can start to really eat away at that memory. So just for the purpose of this review, I'm leaving the memory, um, I'm upgrading the memory to eight gig there. But without further ado, let's crack straight on because let's be honest, if you're using this system, this screen is not the first screen you're going to see, is it? When you're using, utilizing the system for the first time or sign out there, what you're going to be greeted with is this, the user interface of your Synology NAS. You'll use an application, most likely, known as Synology Assistant, and this application allows you to find different devices on your local area network. Again, this tool has not changed much at all all over the years and although we're not reviewing Synology Assistant I will highlight that it does have some fairly you know salient features you can utilize it to, for memory testing something we've talked about before on top of that we're closing it by accident there you can utilize it to do uh, drive mapping and more on the system you're connected with and there's lots of little mini features there it's not the most explosive app but it does get the job done and when you do search your local area network and find an as you can open it up in your web browser today's video is being utilized uh, utilizing microsoft edge Genuinely, the only reason I'm doing that is because Chrome is already pre-linked that I normally use for a bunch of other things. This isn't me advocating Edge. I'm not a fan. But first, we need to do is log into our device. And straight away, you'll see that I'm utilizing an admin with a one in it there. The reason being that the um, original admin account is disabled by default, something I strongly recommend you maintain for the sense of security and only activate it when you need to and create a sub-account, which is what I've done here. Then enter your password, and the next lovely little surprise should appear on screen in just a moment, and that is two-step verification. This system does have multiple methods of enabling two-step verification. I've gone for Google Authenticator, setting it up was really, really quick, and I'm just gonna go ahead and set that up, uh, get that entered right now. So wait for the timer to go through, and we've got that there, and again, 
We're gonna, just in case we log out again, we're going to disable that. But again, for yourselves, always enable two-step. So there we go. There is our interface screen there. So first thing we need to look at is obviously the user interface itself. It's crisp, it's clean, it's incredibly responsive, and logging in is very, very fast. It's probably one of the fastest um, direct to GUI screens I've seen on most NAS platforms there. Um, as a user interface, uh, the first things we're going to look at here are kind of your control panels. So um, if, for example, you want to access any app, go to the start menu up there, boom, these are all of your apps there on screen. And again, this is why we needed eight gig of memory because I've installed a lot of apps for this video. Um, if you do have, weirdly, even more apps than that, you do have the search bar there at the top, but the impressive search bar, something that often gets overlooked outside of uh, kind of the likes of Synology NAS, and particularly if you're a true NAS user, I've always said that true NAS needs something like this, is a nice, simple search box here. So, for example, just searching for a preface there for a file format, and boom, you're covered in lots of information there. And you can extend that to applications, you can extend it to a lot, and it's a quick home screen search functionality. Hell, your OS has that built in. It seems weird when I see NAS software that doesn't. Um, so here at the top, this is where you get your real-time information about stuff. Again, if you've got cloud synchronization, something we're gonna talk about, all of those cloud services and uh, kind of back and forth syncs and backups you're going for will be annotated there at the top. You've got a notifications panel up there for real-time information about the device, things that have happened and things that haven't. And then finally, you've got your own little information panel there and a notifications panel there too. If we go into the personal information there, we can see I've used that Junker Gmail account that we've used before. Again, this is where you can enable two-step verification or use Synology's own uh, C2 password and um, authentication systems with that application they've got there, uh, secure sign-in. Uh, then you've got the ability to customize the desktop user interface there. And again, you can go quite deep. I've left it at default, but you can make a number of changes there about the menu style, the background image, the login screen, the name of the system and more. And there's other stuff and background information there, pretty much about the user and what they're able to use, what they can and can't do. Next up, let's talk about the big one, storage. If you are looking at a Synology NAS and DSM-7, there's every possibility that your priority is going to be how the system maintains storage and what storage services are made available to you. And for that, we head into the storage manager here. Now, as you can see, I've got four drives here. These are all Synology hard drives in a RAID 5 environment there. Now, as we can see, I've already set up a storage pool, which is kind of the base level of your storage. And I've put a volume on there, a nice big volume. That's a container that lives on the pool. Now, when setting up the device, you can take advantage within those volumes and uh, shared folders and such uh, of BTRFS or EXT4 within the Synology platform. But if you are running more modest Synology NAS systems, you're not going to have access um, to BTRFS. There's kind of a threshold there of around 2 gig. Um, even if you're using an ARM-based processor there, it's got to be one of the quad-core ones and the um, Realtex, the RTD1296. So basically, anything lower than about uh, 20, uh, 2220 uh, J and lower, you're not going to be able to take advantage of this service. Um, now, when we look at the storage manager there, we've got things like data scrubbing there. If we want to dig a little bit, we can go into some of the storage services and settings. So, for example, within an individual pool, we can change some of our settings if we choose. Again, depending on the stripe, again, a lot of that is to do with the way data is written across drives. You can adapt that, but I wouldn't advise that. I'd stick it with the default. Another thing worth highlighting, although you can't see it here, um, the Synology uh, in DSM 7.1, most disk station plus series and lower systems take advantage of uh, something called SHR Synology Hybrid RAID which is when you've got multiple drives and you can mix and match larger drives and still take advantage of it. The only reason I've not featured that in today's video is because uh, this uh, DS923 plus is being utilized for 10 GBE testing thanks to an upgrade it features and RAID 5 always gives you slightly better performance than Synology Hybrid RAID when it comes to a lot of the high intense workloads. So that's why I've got a RAID 5 on there but still advocate SHR particularly for its expandability. Now what we've also got the option of here, which we should talk about too, is the SSD cache. Now, this 923 Plus that I'm using has got M2 NVMe base based in the base of it. At the time of recording, you can only use these for caching. However, there is the option to turn these 
into storage pools coming in DSM 7.2. It may not be there at the beta at launch, but it will be coming. The ability to turn M2 NVMEs into uh, areas of storage pool much, much, much faster than traditional slower hard drives there. Now, if we go into individual drives, um, what we can do is check out health information about this drive. Again, smart tests and more. But what's really intriguing is when we look at uh, managing uh, the firmware, because I'm using Synology hard drives here. And you may have heard back and forth about Synology recently when it comes to their position on hard drive compatibility. Luckily, hard drive compatibility and supported and recommended drives is a little bit broader uh, on the Disk Station Plus series than it is on maybe the XS or the SA series. But there's still um, missing drives in the compatibility listing. Anything above 18 TB at the time of recording is still not listed in the compatibility listings, even though I've personally tested several 20 and 22 TB drives from Seagate and WD on Synology NAS systems in the Plus series, and they have worked. But if you do use those drives, you will present it presented with a warning on the screen saying that you're using an unsupported drive. So do bear that in mind. But as you can see, using the Synology hard drives, if there are newer firmware updates available, as you can see here, then you can uh, update these drives from within the Synology DSM system, something you can't do with non-Synology hard drives there. Indeed, as you can see, there is a firmware update available. And what I'm doing right now is I'm saving that for a video coming soon where I'm going to be showing you guys what happens when you update the firmware on drives if you already have an existing RAID and a NAS in use. Does it power down the system? Does it allow the system to keep using? Does it update it one by one? Who's to say? But stay tuned for that video coming soon when I update these drives, but I'm saving that. But the management of the drives can be done several ways. You can either go into the respective storage manager, and then from there, you can go ahead and create new pools if you choose to, add a drive, remove drives, and enable some of the settings. Indeed, some of the settings that are built in here are actually quite impressive. Um, one of the ones I particularly like is things like uh, customizing the RAID build speed, so you can enhance its uh, importance. So for example, if your one of your drives does die and you go into a degraded state and you introduce a new drive, you can adapt the performance of the system to do the job a lot quicker and put more system resources behind that RAID rebuild. Another thing you can take advantage of is fast repair. This is when if you do have that situation where a drive dies, you introduce a new drive and you want to rebuild the RAID, with fast RAID, what it does is only build the drive data, not the whole drive map layout. Now, what I mean by that is when you've got drives, sorry about the flashing there, uh, if, if you do have a drive in your NAS system and um, you've maybe got 10, 20% of the data on that disk, and you've got it spread across the RAID, so maybe you've got 10 terabytes of storage in the whole RAID, but when you've only got about um, two actual TB of data, and the rest is all like 8 TB of capacity empty, in fast rebuild or fast repair, what happens is it only builds the areas on the new disk that data actually resided on, thanks to the parity or the little blueprint that RAID creates. And the rest of the data is just hashed out. And the result is a much, much, much faster RAID rebuild. I had a whole video on this. Do check that out. But it's one of those lovely little features that I don't think gets enough respect. Now, going back to those SSDs, what we can do is use this setting here, manage available drives. And this, I think, could stand to be a little louder. I would quite like it if this tab here was right on the overview or here on the main setting. What it does is allow you to immediately choose a purpose. So for example, with the SSDs, we can manage available drives. And from here, you can see there are two drives that are not being in use, and they can be used for different things. So what we can do is go ahead and create, try to create a storage pool. But as you can see, right now, at the time of recording, you can't utilize these drives for storage pools. That is a feature that will be enabled in the future in DSM 7.2. But what we can do is create an area of SSD cache. Had we been installing a new hard drive, like a replacement drive, we could have used any of these options here to either repair or enhance our existing RAID. But for now, we can select uh, the RAID. Next thing, uh, the uh, cache. 
Next thing we need to do is uh, assign it to a volume. So this is one of those uh, the containers of storage that we created earlier on, utilizing uh, those storage that storage based on top of the pool. So that's the volume I created earlier on. We click next. From there, we select which kind of caching we want to do. Now, at the moment, write caching on its own is not available. You've only got the options of read write cache and read only cache. Now, read only cache is when data, uh, this is this one here, read only cache is when when data is more uh, more frequently accessed, micro data, so to speak, on the whole storage area within the Synology system, with read-only cache, copies of that data is moved to the areas of M2 NVMe SSD. And then when that data is being more frequently requested in future, rather than pull it from the slower, larger hard drives, it pulls it from the faster SSD. But do bear in mind the benefits of caching more generally are felt more in reduced latency and responsiveness. It doesn't really affect larger, chunky sequential data. It's more IO data. But the real benefit is read-write caching. Now, you need to have at least two SSDs in order to take advantage of read-write caching. But in read-write caching, um, you've got the benefits of that read caching mentioned earlier on. But in the write cache, what happens is, is as data is being sent to the NAS standard upload or just general use, it is written to the SSD, which then inst internally it's then moved over to the slower RAID hard drive array. Now, that benefits upload performance there, but of course it does take its toll on system resources and you need a bit more memory in order to facilitate that backend that back management as data is being passed over from the NVMe to the hard drives. But still, I would always recommend read-write caching to take advantage of that additional performance. The reason you need two is it's going to create a RAID 1 environment on the uh, SSDs for uh, the fault tolerance, as mentioned there on screen, but also because it needs it for that performance overall. So let's enable that feature there. We understand um, if the cache is removed in error, it can affect the write cache uh, uh, more so than anything. And again, you can choose only a RAID 1 with this setting, obviously, because that's the way read-write is set up there. You'd need to have uh, kind of even numbers of drives. And again, with that, we're going to select both of those drives for the RAID 1 environment. We're going to max the capacity because we're going to use it for that cache. And that's it. We click Apply. It will erase the drives, of course. And then we can click OK. And then from there, what it's going to do is uh, create our area of SSD cache, which is then going to benefit one of our storage pools, more precisely, Volume 1. So as you can see, the as it's mounting the cache there, it's a slight dip, but now we can see that we've got our SSD cache being created there for our area or our volume area there, and we are all good to go. And you can monitor that and get a lot more real-time information about that and configure some of that here. So if you want, you can pin uh, the BTRS metadata that's kind of built into the operation of certain key Synology applications and have that rolled in there. So that's exactly what I'm going to do and pin that information, uh, pin that metadata information in there directly onto the SSDs to enhance performance of those drives. You don't have to do that, but it's a nice little feature. Now, moving away from the storage manager, which is kind of like the management, uh, hence the word manager, area of your storage, what about actual interface? What about interacting with your storage? Well, there are several ways we can do that. Now, how you access the data on the NAS really will come down to your own kind of preference in accessing it. One of the ways in which I'm not going to talk around a lot of detail but is available is if you want to use some of Synology's own mobile applications, such as Synology Drive or DS File for mobile. Again, that allows you to access your data very, very quickly and in a nice breadcrumb style on your mobile device. But today we're focusing a lot more on the desktop, as you can see here. So... Again, as Synology is getting maybe arguably a little bit more business orientated, I know a number of you are going to wonder about this. Let's talk about business level storage and let's talk about SAN or iSCSI storage. Now, this is when you want the storage on your NAS to be treated as if it's locally to your connected system. To put that into perspective, when you're using your own um, homegrown PC or Mac system, let's go into my uh, my PC folder there, 
you can see there I've got a couple of drives which I'll admit are very very full right now the reason they're very full is because this is a, a recording laptop here and it's constantly flushed every few days get off my back but the key important detail here is these drives have the appearance of localized storage because they are localized. One's an NVMe and one's a SATA drive. Now, the NAS that you're dealing with, you're accessing it in the web browser there. So what if you don't really want to do it that way? Um, well, an iSCSI LUN uh, uh, via a target is the best, most high performance way to bolt on your NAS storage to your local Mac or Windows or Linux system and be able to interact with it with the appearance, as far as your system is concerned, of local. What that means is you can use tools like this to create areas of storage, big blocks of storage that you can define in advance, which can then be smacked on and visible via an iSCSI target initiator, such as one of the ones that you get with Windows, and Mac has got their own equivalent. I'm sorry, I don't know that name on the top of my head. And that gives you that ability to create an area of storage independent of everything else on the NAS, all the apps, all of that stuff, this big block of data, which is then visible. And again, you can cater a lot of that. And the SAN manager from Synology has seen numerous updates since it was originally the iSCSI manager there. And thanks to improvements on network connectivity, it can do a great deal more. I will say say that the application is still not that user friendly it's as user friendly as you can get but we're still talking about LUNs and targets and quite complex storage there so for example we can go ahead and give this a capacity of let's say 250 gig again there are settings for change of the performance but nowhere near enough information for a lot of users to understand the key difference which of course is uh, that uh, one setting allows you to create a block of storage that is immovable and unchangeable whereas the other one you can create a borderline infinite space which you can then grow within but again you do have performance pros and cons throughout then from there, you can go ahead and select the initiator or create a brand new one. An initiator is basically uh, a target initiator is the uh, doorway that you are opening for the line of communication. So it's not traditional. And after that, you can just go ahead and create the settings and create that area of storage very, very quickly. Now, maybe you don't want the data storage to have the appearance of local, but you still want to access it on the NAT, uh, on your local microsoft or windows system but you just want it to be an area storage you can see and that is where a synology user has a tremendous amount of options open to them there so probably one of the easiest and most basic uh, and this is available on most nas brands is if you go into that synology assistant we mentioned earlier on right click you can map a network drive and mapping a network drive allows you to have pre-selected shared folders on your system something i'll talk about later on to have them appearing here on that list of available drives but bear in mind they will not have as far as your os is concerned the kind of native localized uh, language and, uh, and visibility the result is that it will kind of be no different to connecting a usb drive i wish i had one here a usb drive and although your system can interact with it and send data back and forth to it you can't install apps on it you can't do a lot of the things that an inherently localized appearing drive can do now another option you have open to you outside of iSCSI land manager and this is a big one this is probably for me one of the most important and it's one of the apps that's really grown with Synology and it went from an outlier app to one of their big top five is Synology Drive <clears throat> if you are looking if you're a, um, a standalone you know business you know sole operator or you're in a small team drive is pretty much the go-to app for you now what you're seeing here is the uh, is Synology drive here on the desktop it allows you to uh, it's quite comparable to the likes of google drive and dropbox and things like that and it allows you via a web browser and via a shareable portal to access your storage. Now, again, you've got all the folders there. You've got all of the data. But what's really interesting is within this, you can open up a whole manner of applications. So, for example, unlike if you were trying to access your data via the, web, uh, via the internet on a breadcrumb level, you can go ahead and do a lot. So, for example, you can open PDFs in the window here and choose if you want to open them up into other apps so for example here is a press release for Synology's SAS based drives here that was a uh, .docx here and then from there we can open it up into Synology's own 
uh, uh, alternative to Office application, Synology Office. So again, we can now do the editing, we can type, we can do all of those things that we want to do, as well as import it over into their own user interface with their own tools to allow us. And this is included with the app. And again, that tool doesn't just open up docs, it opens up for example, Excel documents. So this was a document I had or I was running comparisons on different uh, SSDs. And then from there, you can edit that all within Synology Office as it imports it over. The SM7.2 is bringing improved formats and uh, file support as well as watermarks and other features in DSM 7.2 that we'll cover later on. But again, it's Synology Office within Drive is already absolutely, and it even goes as far as opening PowerPoint presentations or PPTXs, but I will say Synology Office doesn't handle PPTXs as well as it does all the other things. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of Synology Office, which is a real shame. And I might get around to making a dedicated Synology Office video very, very soon, because I do think it's an app that doesn't get anywhere near the respect it deserves. And again, it allows you to open all of these file types. And that includes images as well, of course. We can open up images and again, you can find out information about those, but there are better ways to open up images from within the Synology NAS platform. But the beauty of Drive isn't everything I've showed you, which already is pretty darn good. They, this was what was included in Drive on day one, and also with the inclusion of Synology Office there, one of the applications within the app center there. Where it gets really, let's go to the installed apps, where it gets really interesting as an application is when you want to attach it to your localized storage system. So, as mentioned, here on the screen, those are my drives there. But what you may not have noticed is here on the left-hand side of the screen, right here at the bottom, is Synology Drive. This is because I've used Synology Drive to bolt on my network drive and be able to utilize my own local file explorer. In this case, Windows, Windows Explorer. You can use Standard Finder on Mac. So... For example, I've got a couple of NASs attached here, but let's look at the DS923+. Plus. There's the My Drive folder, and there is all of the files, folders, and docu documents all there within that Synology Drive folder. To put it into perspective there in the background is Synology Drive. There's the Drive folder, and this is what we're looking at here, side by side. The other thing I will highlight is this allows us to affect immediate change to these files. Um, now, you may also notice while we're looking at these, let's bring these images up nice and large, there's a little green tick here on a lot of these files and folders, or a little cloud. That's because Synology Drive also includes uh, file pinning and file streaming. So, so when you hear streaming, you think Netflix, you think sitting there on your sofa, this is better than that. So one of the big problems of accessing your NAS remotely and still wanting to enjoy things on a local level is space. A lot of the time, our NASs will have terabytes of storage, and the reason we have the NAS is because we don't want that terabytes of storage to live on our Windows laptop, our, our PC, our Mac, whatever. Now, with these, what you've got is the ability to pick and choose things on the fly. So to put it into perspective, that green tick means this file has been downloaded and is on my system. That's us viewing it within Windows. We right-click it, go to Properties, we can see there that it is a 4.57 megabyte image that is taking up 4.75 megabytes of space. However, if we go to the bottom and go into the documents, some of the stuff we just looked at, you can see there that these have all got a cloud next to them. Now that means that these are on the NAS and we can see that they exist and even get thumbnail information. But as you can see, although this file is 2 point, uh, it's 228 kilobytes in scale, it hasn't taken any size up on my local PC. So what we can do if we choose is either double click it to open the file, it then communicates over with our Synology NAS and opens the file. And there you go, there is the file we were looking at earlier on being opened locally. And if we go down, we'll be able to see that this file will now have a green tick. And that means the file has is got local data there, as we can see, and now it's taken up more space. But what we can do is use the native Synology Drive menu to do certain things. So one, if we want to create a share link with this file, we can go ahead and create a shareable link that we can share with different people, with different rules and more to share this file. And all of this on our side. We're not using the NAS in the web browser. We're using our side to do it. 
On top of that, we can right click, go back to the Synology Drive menu, and then from there, we can browse previous versions because there is version control, which I'll show you in a moment, as well as pin up a copy locally. So if you choose, you can pin this. So now this file will always be on your local system. You can see the green tick has changed color, and now that will always be there on your local system as well as the NAS. So you can pick and choose which files are important, which ones are kind of accessed, and then after a certain retention period are then deleted from your disk, or you can choose which files that you can see them in a kind of shadow form here, and when you want to access them, double click and you get to go in. So those options are just what makes Synology Drive such a great native user-friendly application. And if you choose, do you know what? I wanna get rid of that space and you can do this on multiple files. Just click up free space and boom, it will remove that from your local system, keep it as a um, indexed file there. It leaves it on the NAS. And as you can see now, it's no longer taking up space. It's a lovely feature. And all of this is being done on my local machine and not being done on the NAS. Now you can, there's lots of options to uh, configure your Synology Drive um, setup there. And again, the beauty of Drive is that you could have a team of 8, 10, 20 people, all in different locations, and all of them connected to the same team folder or folders. You can create multiple on the fly. And all of these folders and all of this layout allows you to um, connect multiple users to the same area and with new improvements coming in 7.2 for shadow files and retention policies and locked uh, uh, file policies, particularly with um, WORM, worm read, write, one, read, many coming very, very soon. Synology Drive is getting bigger and better. And although there are applications I'm gonna talk about later in the video that do not impress me as uh, that much, this is one of those enormous standout applications for me that continues to get better all the time. But for all this highfalutin stuff, we also have to talk about um, what if you just want to access the files on the quick? What if you just want to do it on the web browser? And if you want to, you can just use FileStation. FileStation is pretty much comparable to a normal uh, file explorer on Windows or Mac. Now, if we go back to FileStation here, we've got the usual options you'd expect. We can extract files. We can zip them up in little archives copy, paste, play things within the browser. There's lots of options all built in, as well as share properties to allow us to share these files in a number of ways. And if you have enabled remote access on your Synology NAS, that will allow you to do that. It's a very, very comprehensive file management tool. And although it's not as highfalutin with a lot of the features as Synology Drive, it's still a damn fine application. And again, DS file for mobile is probably one of the best NAS file explorer apps out there. And again, lots of settings, lots of things that you can enable. One of which, of course, is shared folders and uh, create new shared folders. These are the folders with which, as the name suggests, you can share the content to the data locally of the network or the internet. Again, creating them is very easy. Again, you can choose how uh, the retention policy of these. So if we go for share test, we can go ahead. We're putting it on that volume we created. We can decide whether we want a recycle bin. We can decide whether we want this hidden from network searches and more. And again, we can choose whether we want them to, uh, if we create this shared folder for subfolders to require uh, further permissions or not. Again, we can choose whether to encrypt this, which is great. And at the moment, you can only encrypt on DSM 7.2 at this shared folder level, but in DSM 7.2, they are enabling volume level encryption, which is something people have been waiting for for a long, long, long time. But you can at least encrypt the shared folder. It will generate a key and which will get spat out and it's, you know, we can save that locally. I'm not gonna do it now, but that option is open to you. You can enable lots of background stuff. You can choose whether you want this folder to have a preset limit so it doesn't spiral out of control, or you can choose for there to be uh, data integrity checks, which again is part of the inbuilt features of things like BTRFS. And that is pretty much it. And then you go, you've created your new shared folder. Before you create it, you can choose which users and which onboard applications can access this. So say for example, you're using this for Plex and you've installed Plex, go to system internal user, which is basically their fancy way of saying apps, select the Plex media server application and say that it can access read only or read and write. Of course, read only means they can see the data, but they can't delete it or add to it. 
read write means they can do access and edit and more and you can customize that level of access as well same goes if you want to have individual local users and with different users having their own rights and services we'll talk a little bit about users later on but again you can choose who can access it and how they can access it and if you've created subgroups if you're a business user you've got marketing sales logistics hr you can choose which of those users can access it and that's it that's how easy it is to create that shared folder and then from within Synology drive you can add further folders to your system and allow access to uh, all of these different files and folders that you're creating there shared test and if we want we can enable that to be accessed in Synology Drive as well with versioning policies where you can roll back file formats but bear in mind the retention policies as mentioned and the rollback policies are customized and not infinite so that is some of the great ways in which you can access data on there and or, you know, this is a review and an overview of DSM 6.2, but I've got to say at this juncture, file access and file management and just general the user interface of file management is unparalleled on DSM compared uh, on DSM when you look at any other platform and it's just fantastic. But let's carry on. So next up, let's talk about managing the actual server hardware because the system settings behind DSM that allow you to configure the system in the control panel, although user-friendly, are not quite as highfalutin as I would like to see. There are elements of system configuration and control which I think could be slightly improved upon. Synology has made it abundantly clear that their platform should be usable by both system admins and relative IT novices. And in that remit, they've done fantastically well. But it has to be said that there are still some areas that the more technically versed are going to be less impressed by. So this is our user interface here. This is the full control panel here. It's a little bit like the early days um, of um, kind of uh, Windows there with the control panel. I don't like it when it's that oversimplified. Um, but again, I know that's not for everyone. And you can pretty much control anything here. So for example, we looked at shared folders earlier. You can configure a lot of those settings there. File services, most of which are disabled by default for security reasons, can all be adapted and managed here via this setup. And again, if you are using remote access settings, it's worth highlighting there are a number of very, very, very important settings here for you to look at. You may have noticed the word not secure during my video here at the top left there. That is something we'll be talking about in just a moment with regards to certificates. But for now, the majority of settings are disabled by default until you install certain applications that require their services. And even then, it advises you in advance that this setting is going to be activated and that you need to be aware of what you are doing there. So again, it does try to keep things simple, but still there are the warnings there. And indeed, talking of warnings, we haven't even talked about one of the other favorite settings I'm going to run here in the background, and that is Security Advisor, which scans your system for inherent vulnerabilities or inconsistencies or more uh, inconsistencies in your uh, storage layout. And moreover, just makes recommendations for improvement. So while I'm going through all this, I'm just going to run that because you may see the word at risk, something we are going to talk about. Because again, this is just the system alerting me to vulnerabilities, which is exactly what we want it to do. So we're going to scan that there in the background and come back to that later in the video. But earlier on, I mentioned about users and their level of access. Creating users is pretty quick. So if we want to, we can create a brand new user here. Let's give them a name. Let's call them um, Clive. I don't know why Clive. Um, again, we've got to generate them a password. And again, all of these users can have two-step authentication and more enabled. Again, they can have their email address and that can be wired in to notifications and more. And again, you can choose, do you want them to have, add them to a group or do you want to create a brand new group? Something I'll show you in a moment. But say Clive is a family member. Then we can choose which application, uh, the shared folder applications that he can have access to. So I'm going to allow him to have read-only access to Plex Media Server, where that data lives. Next, we can say the usage quota. And again, the usage quota there can be set in terms of data quite easily. Again, I'm going to leave that blank. And lastly, you can choose the uh, preset application permissions. And again, all I want this person to be able to use, I'm going to give them access to the Synology Photos. And I'm going to give them access to perhaps, um, let's go, let's say Audio Station. Let them have multimedia access there. So that's it. And again, we can choose their uh, network speed with regard to different protocols in case we're worried about bandwidth hogging. 
and that's it we've now created clive's account and now we want to again we've moved clive into the family group and again groups can have their rules changed very quickly on the fly in terms of what they can access who's in them their quotas and again rather than you know changing the configuration of preset users you can oversee and change the whole groups and i quite like the way that's presented indeed if we want we can delegate powers to different um, users temporarily so say for example we go into the user group and that new uh, user clive who we've given sod all access to if we want we can give him temporary powers of admin again do not do this a willy-nilly but it allows you to change their rules for a brief period and give them powers beyond their uh, normal roles which you can then remove on the fly and again you can view their permissions very quickly or uh, reassign them on the fly very quickly indeed but there are certain things i'm less impressed by again when you're creating users you can import users there from existing databases so for example if we wanted to import we can send in and browse different you know preset configs but the level and the depth and breadth of existing uh, formats of uh, larger groups of users isn't as broad as i've seen in other users and again we can copy paste and create cloned users there it's nice but there's certain things like uh, profile photos aren't really there you have to go in manually with each of their users and then within those individual users create personalized accounts there isn't kind of the widespread management for an admin here as a power user that I would like to see. Things like phone numbers and a lot of the, the moving about the visual interface of users what I would like to see. That a lot of um, uh, uh, CRMs or uh, customer management tools, that's not really there. I kind of would have liked to have seen a little bit more. They've got a really good CMS, uh, content management system. But uh, see like something like a CRM, a customer relationship manager, even a client relationship manager would be nice to see here, which is a real shame that isn't there. And that's something I'm really surprised Synology has not rolled out into their larger array of applications within DSM. Now, again, we can configure things like a remote access. As you can see, I've created a quick connect account to this device. Don't worry, I'm going to be disabling that after this video. Um, this allows users uh, to access this NAS remotely. So again, although if I click that now, it will get pushed directly into local, what we can do is this would be an identity to access this NAS remotely over the internet and from there allow us to configure a number of those settings and access the NAS like we would locally. And this is the same thing that's used if we want to access our drive folder remotely and therefore allows us to create are um, perfectly configurable and localized access NAS where we have users that are having connection to our Synology NAS over the internet and allow us to have backup and synchronization of existing folders. To put it into perspective, here is a folder I have on my own Synology NAS here in the background and this is where a lot of my archival footage is kept. And as you can see, some folders that I'm not working on have gone into history they've gone into the cloud folder there whereas some of them i'm currently working on such as saving electricity uh, running your nas this is one that has that green tick and certain projects that are in use are moving back and forth thanks to that file pinning and streaming there so again you've got lots of ways to use that remote access and this allows me to have access to my data anywhere in the world as securely as possible with full encrypted tunnels back and forth so again, that's really, really nice. Network interfaces on the device, although you can do a lot of management and change things like the MTU, or if you add the 10 GBE and stuff like that, uh, to this particular NAS at least, you can all manage that great with traffic control and more, but I'm sad it lacks a kind of uh, graphical user interface off the box. Knowing them by identity or IP, particularly if you're running a dynamic IP setup rather than fixed IP, I'm sad there isn't a graphical interface there of the system you're using again i think that's something they should have most other nas brands have that and the lack of that in dsm given their tremendous swing towards keeping things user friendly is a real shame there but there is a lot of network configuration tools all built in there that you can take advantage of and again lots of things with regards to configuring that and when you want to look at uh, changing some of the remote ip stuff there or open up upnp and port forwarding that can all be uh, adapted quite well within this setup too now going on that subject we can talk about security i said i'd come to it later on 
There's a lot of the default stuff that's built into the Synology here. The presets are very high in security. We've already done our network scan there, and you can see that the network there, the configuration is pretty good because a lot of the settings I have not changed there. So, for example, you can change the logout timer there if there's no application or activity. You can also, if you choose to, not only enable two-step authentication, something I've done, but you can enable lots of settings where you can fix it. So if someone tries to uh, get uh, an errored access, if someone's trying to batter your IP there, remote or otherwise, you can have it so failed login attempts will have an auto block that will activate for a certain period of time. And then you, if you're a system admin, will get a notification if you set up those settings to go, someone is hammering, trying to do a DDoS or just trying to break into your system. And they, that IP is now locked out, as is that account locked out, but your system admin can then look into it and put up the walls appropriately. And again, you can trust different client devices, you can trust different devices on your local area network, all of which can be set up to put barriers and more and more hurdles to stop people getting in. Talking of hurdles, you can enable the pre-built firewall, but you can edit the rules on the fly if you choose, but the default firewall rules are pretty darn good. Um, with the auto block, you can configure a lot of that, and the same thing goes to that denial of service attack there. How and where you want DOS protection built in, and as you can see, you can enable DOS on port one on the fly if we choose. Just bear in mind that it can be, if you're running applications and services, and if you have a dynamic IP, it's very easy to accidentally trigger the DOS protection. That's nothing to do with Synology, it's a lot to do with third-party client, that's why a lot of the time it's disabled by default. But for those of the particularly security conscious, you can always throw that on. Security certificate, something we've talked about there. Now, this is if you want to have that valid security certificate applied to your system to allow it to uh, be authenticated in certain security checks. Now, bear in mind, you don't get one from Synology. Some Synology applications, as you can see, have them built in. Uh, that arrive with the service but for the overall system they do allow you uh, the option of going straight in and enabling and getting a free let's encrypt account but bear in mind there's a, a few extra steps in there you do have to register a domain you do have to supply email address information there and again it's all nice and simple you can get that as a third party certificate or go via the interface i'm not going to do it here and the reason i've not authenticated it here is i've already created several let's encrypt certificates for other videos and nas is in this network environment and i'm fairly certain right now i'm running a risk of absolutely ruining it for myself but that option is open to you and the same thing goes with enabling different levels of security to your remote access uh, HTTP uh, uh, and other protocol um, access all can be like broke in and lots of settings there most of which are either disabled or at the very least ad advise you on what can happen if you do enable them because they can affect performance and that's one of the other reasons Synology tends to disable these now again for the more techie the terminal access there let's don't say the terminal access point there will allow you to patch into your NAS on a command line level but bear in mind this is when things get techy and also once again disabled by default because in the last few years when we've seen other NAS brands hit by ransomware attacks one of the chief components of this is an attack methodology coming via open uh, uh, ports or via a net, uh, remote UPnP and stuff like that but also managing to get access to SSH level commands or Telnet, uh, predominantly SSH. So they're always disabled by default there. So carrying on, we've got the system information, how you can configure the device on the fly, what you saw earlier on, uh, how different interfaces are displayed. The configuration and the set work and the network setup of your NAS is all pretty detailed there. And the configuration is pretty darn good. It isn't as customizable as somewhere like you can apply some uh, moving GIFs and stuff like that. And you can change the user interface quite easily and all those are available. And again, these are all fairly standard options here that you're seeing. A lot of the configuration options as well. Same with the external devices, although big criticism I have for um, USB support on DSM is that it's got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Synology has really streamlined and narrowed down USB support on their devices. And although some devices are supported, there ain't a lot anymore. So this has become increasingly less relevant over time there. Now, with regards to USB updates, sorry, not USB, um, uh, DSM updates there, 
the options are pretty darn good. Notwithstanding, you can have the update settings to automatically apply updates, either the minor or the large update, all the time to make sure that your um, uh, security updates and security patches and fixes and awareness are as high as they can be. On top of that, what you can do is run certain backups. You can configure your DSM account and all of your settings to be backed up to your online account or to a localized file that you can upload to DSM if you do a system reset or you get a brand new box there. And again, all of these configuration options and files are all built in and I do recommend maybe setting one of these up on a routine privately. Again, system recovery, system restore, all fairly evident, all built in there. And finally, there is the stuff there with regards to managing the system on the fly all the time. So indexing services for things like um, uh, thumbnail generation and indexing certain files and folders are all configurable here. And again, the same thing goes for thumbnail quality. And again, this will differ quite a lot on the power of your NAS device. If you're a multimedia user, you are recommended to go through this to choose which files and folders are being indexed for certain kinds of media. But bear in mind, for specific applications such as Plex Media Server, you should really go and set this up within their user interfaces. But within Synology applications, it's recommended to set those up there. And again, all of this configuration and control is adaptable very, very easily and quickly. And as long as you set up a Synology account as well, you can configure and manage a lot of these services and applications remotely or locally, as well as enable and establish access to all of the features and services anywhere in the world, especially that Synology drive. So now we've discussed at length the system services and configuration of your storage and the NAS as a whole. Let's get our hands dirty and start talking about applications, key AAA plus services and tools that are built in to DSM 7.1. And the very, very first thing we should talk about are backups. Although in the App Center from Synology, there are all manner of applications and services, some of which are integral to the running of the system and others that are built in to the system to allow um, uh, improved and more native level access and more tailored access to data, it should be said that the range of tools and applications and services is incredibly diverse. And in some cases, there are multiple versions of a given app, such as Active Backup, for example, something we'll talk about later on, that are even more tailored to different end, end users there, as you can see there. Again, lots of configuration, lots of tools there. And although we're not going to cover all of them, because this video is already going to be like an hour and a half, two hours long, there are so many to discuss. So when it comes to backup, the key applications to talk about are the following four. And probably the one that most home users or small low level users are gonna to get to grips with is this, Hyper Backup. Hyper Backup is your entry point, I would say, into your three, two, one backup strategy, making sure you've got data in at least two other locations, three to push as well. Now, what I mean by that is, is most users when they're using a NAS, if they're using mobile phones or laptops or whatever, they're going out and about, they're taking photos, they're living their life, they're doing videos, enjoying it, you know. And at the same time, they're sending that data to their cloud or their NAS. And then from time to time, they go, whoa, I'm running out of space. And then they delete things from their phone, their tablet, their laptop. And when they do that, the NAS ain't no backup no more because you've only got the data in one location now. And it was, you know, in that on that NAS and you've got RAID, which is not a backup. It's a safety net or a fail safe. You need that data in at least two locations, at least. That is where Hyper Backup comes in, because it allows you to patch in multiple different backup routines and indeed some synchronization routines as well, and therefore not have to think about your data going into lots of locations. Now, the range of supported services in Hyper Backup are incredible. Not only can you back up to another NAS and back up to Synology's own C2 cloud platform there, you've also got the option of connecting with several third-party cloud providers as well. And again, if you have some free allotted space on a cloud account or maybe your phone contract or uh, your new laptop or even an external storage drive that you buy arrives with an area of cloud storage space, you can bolt that cloud storage space on in a number of different ways and allow those key most important files on your NAS, which might not be the whole array, it might just be photos of your firstborn child or your wedding, to be backed up there 
automatically in the background of your system and again lots of different file services supported there within hyper backup this is again much like drive one of the key applications of dsm 7.1 and indeed when 7.2 rolls around i would recommend it in there as well as you can see i've created two different routines here i'm using a localized storage backup here for one folder and uh, a google drive cloud backup there and again you can action them have them on a schedule which is what i've done and you can configure them on the fly as well as find out some statistical information on those backups about what's been backed up how much data how it's going if there's any failures and more lots of different configuration options there built in now hyper backup as the reason i said it was the entry point is there is a much bigger and better tool coming up soon known as active backup which i'm going to show you in a moment which really pushes things to the very you know just insane levels but just before we get there there's a couple of other little tools i think home users and even some small business users might want to get on board with the first one is usb copy now usb copy runs on a very similar logic to that of hyper backup usb copy is when you attach a usb drive to your nas and you can have routines that either back up the contents of the usb onto the nas or the nas onto the usb but it's more than that not only can you have triggered backups where a usb that's predefined is connected and it automatically actions that backup but what you can also do is go ahead with the backup um to um trigger at certain times of day and then auto eject as needed so for example this is a usb backup here that's running regularly right now again what we can do is configure this backup very very quickly and we can see the different uh, settings there for the backup uh, tool but what we can do is go into the task here which we've created and this backup routine actually if we start a brand new one that might make more sense we can first choose the rules of our usb backup within the app so again photo and video import in there so you can only focus on multimedia if you choose or full data um, if you choose to or you can go for data export where it's a lot more uh, configured and again with different directions either going onto the USB from the NAS or onto onto the NAS from the USB so say we wanted to do a backup routine from the USB onto the NAS so first we give it a name we'll call this one test USB uh, test why not first we have to select the source so again this is where it's backing up from the usb so say i wanted to back up let's choose an arbitrary file here let's pick cheese backup so that is literally an image of a picture of cheese then we choose where on our Synology nas we want to back that photo uh, that image up so i'm going to put it into the photos folder there and i'm going to back that file up into misc food from there we can choose the uh, provisional uh, versioning control so multi-version means it maintains uh, 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 multiple versions of that file over time mirroring means the two folders have to be the same incremental means when you're backing up your data regularly say every single day it will only back up the changed data rather than doing a wholesale backup every single time like a multi-version backup would where it creates individual backups an incremental one will only back up the new files so say you're adding another 100 megabytes per day it will only back up that 100 megs each time there so say we go for uh, an incremental backup there then we click next from there we can choose what happens so uh, we can copy data every time that usb drive is connected if we choose we can also decide whether we want it to disconnect each time so if you're going to leave the usb connected all the time not hugely advised uh, you can have it so it runs on a schedule every single day so you can pick a time of day and then that time every day it will run that back up onto the usb from the nas if we choose or vice versa again we can choose different rules so if we like we can say we only want a certain kind of file or preset files and folders and extensions that we do not want to use next up we can see that the usb test has now been completed there we can see it there and we can see the overview of it and we can run it whenever we want or if we put it on a schedule it will take care of itself we can change that uh, on the fly and a lot of these rules and roles can all be adapted over time there and again for a usb backup routine although this is kind of like a fraction of what hyper backup is capable of it's still very good to add this as another layer of your backup retention strategy now talking of adding layers we can talk there about cloud synchronization that is right we're able to use cloud synchronization to attach our existing cloud service providers and these in turn will act as a synchronized area 
where your cloud data there is visible to your NAS and it will appear in one of your available folders via file station there. So again, a lovely means and way to enjoy data in multiple locations via a single user interface. And again, if you set your system up right in terms of localized storage and double down on Synology Drive on top, it allows you to access your cloud areas um, via the user interface of your standard uh, uh, native file explorer on your PC or Mac system. And the NAS does all of the background work there. And again, once you roll in routines of backup, roll in Synology Drive and roll in your local client apps, you've got a, a hugely capable storage system open to you. And again, a lot of different storage cloud providers are all been added there. And again, you can configure a lot of these settings, what the retention policy is and more, all backed in there, all in the background, all running on your Synology NAS at all times, and you can choose the ways and means very easily. But as mentioned, these are all quite not, con they're not all consumer businesses can obviously take advantage of them. The, the main, main, main business application is, of course, active backup. As mentioned earlier on, active backup arrives in several forms. And if you are running an existing software as a service or SAAS platform with Office 365 or Google Workspace, and you're already using that, you're using the email, you're using the user accounts, you're using all of that data that's there and all of their services, what you can do is use a tool like Active Backup Suite, um, or Active Backup for Business, to synchronize that whole area to your NAS, your bare metal NAS, and allow you tailored access to all of that data. And just generally acts as a means of creating another layer of access to those cloud services. Now, the reason I bring that up is as good as 365 and Workspace are, it's worth highlighting that if your business is rolling around those software as a service platforms, the minute you lose internet connection, you might have the client apps on your local system, but you lose a lot of that access. And the minute you've got a severed internet connection with those services, some of the localized metadata and some of the cached data might keep you going for a little tiny amount of time, but you'll very quickly hit error walls as your client applications that are based on Workspace and 365 are losing connectivity. Now, the reason you would synchronize with Active Backup Suite uh, on those platforms and have them added using their own tailored tools is because then your localized systems aren't accessing the cloud. What they're accessing is the NAS, which has synchronized all of that data, all of the big background data there. So your localized system won't know. Your local system is accessing this enormous repository, the bare metal backup of your Synology NAS, which has synchronized all that data from 365 or Workspace. And then later on, when internet connectivity is restored, the NAS will reestablish all of that data with the cloud. Now, that is not the full length of what Active Backup can do, because Active Backup is fantastic for backing up your mainline services so your pcs i've got two pcs here that are backed up ignore that it says failed that's because i left the pc off overnight during a backup the one on the other side of the room but you can back up wholesale os level backup there not just files and folders on top of that you can add individual linux file servers or databases and you can map this with paas and saas hypervisors like uh, vmware and hyper v to back up your existing virtual machine environment to the NAS with the option, by the way, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, to deploy some of those VMs on the Synology NAS with Virtual Machine Manager there. Hyper, I'm sorry, Active Backup is free. If you want to use some of the more enterprise-grade add-ons and services or run virtual DSM, that is when you start talking licenses. But on the outset, Active Backup and its primary services are free. Oh, I say free, they are included in your system. And it is a fantastic application. That arguably, if I make a video on it, will be longer than this one just on that app. And the configuration, the controls, uh, the, uh, the kind of rollback retention policies and benefits of Active Backup are enormous. It is, again, very much based on business users and it's also rolled in with a number of Synology C2 services uh, alongside Active Insight and soon shared cloud services. It really can't be underestimated there. And again, if you're a business user that's already using 
uh, uh, workspace or using Office 365. But what you're worried about is all your data being on the cloud and nothing localized. This is Synology bringing in their systems to synchronize with those third party platforms. I will argue that it is a little bit more streamlined than I'd like, and I think they have opened up the app a lot more in the last year or so, but it's still a single portal access point to manage all of those tasks with a lot of statistical information there in the background. And it is another one of those jewel in the crown apps for DSM-7. Another thing I just noticed is throughout this video up to this point, my active backup suite, um, a client application on my Windows side, has been backing up my system all the time, running there in the background, which for me, I absolutely love. The fact that my system is now synchronizing there in the background with the NAS in order to make sure the Windows machine I'm utilizing is backed up to active backup all the time even when i'm using which is a lovely native background service that is so silent i didn't even realize it was happening throughout this video fair play next up let's discuss multimedia let's be realistic a lot of home users a lot of prosumer users and a lot of people that have been running their multimedia collection off of usb sticks sticks or an old imac tucked under a desk or an old pc tower case or an old laptop that's sitting there in the corner buzzing away one of the reasons you've looked at a nas and dsm from synology is you want to know how it plays multimedia and how well it plays multimedia and although the hardware that you choose inside the synology nas that you opt for has a tremendous impact on how the system will play back multimedia. It should be said that all the applications I'm going to show you now are largely available on the entirety of Synology NAS systems. So let's go with the proprietary stuff. Let's go with the Synology apps because there is some third party stuff as well to discuss. So if you go into the standard file explorer on your Synology NAS, you can look at some media. So for example, if we go ahead and try and open up this image here, you can open the image in the file explorer there, picture of a Christmas tree. And there's a bit of information. You can get some of the background stuff there on it. It has scraped some of that metadata there out of the image, but it's by no means ideal. A lot of you are gonna to wanna to look at your multimedia from the comfort of your sofa. You're gonna to wanna to be looking at it on your phone, your tablet, your whatever, or just sharing it. So. That is why there are tailored applications. So first and foremost, let's talk about Synology Photos. Now Synology Photos, I want to love it. I really do. I really, really want to love Synology Photos. But this is one of the areas of the video that I mentioned earlier on where I'm just not satisfied. It is a good application. It is a great way to view your photos. It has a tremendous degree of support. They have increased a lot of the file format support to there. I like the fact that the thumbnail generation is very, very, very snappy built in there. The user interface there, a lot of it, there's that cheese photo being backing up. And again, you can find out a lot of information about these things. What an awful GIF. Um, but some photos, if there is metadata present in the original photos, you can scrape a lot of that data out. So for example, this one, because it's backed up from a, a localized source, there's not a tremendous amount of information to play with. But if we scroll along and find ourselves an interesting photo there, let's find a photo of something intriguing. How about a picture of the Home Alone board game? Um, if we have a look there at that photo, we have an enormous amount of information there scraped from the metadata. And that information is then utilized by the system to create a lot of the smart album control. So whether you want to use the filter to enable filter, so I only want photos from 2020, I only want photos, I want photos in the United Kingdom, or if there are other presets there, I can go ahead. Now we've created a quick file format there, and then if I choose to, I can go ahead, uh, and enable a folder view if I choose to, or I can go ahead and view them in that timeline, but also create smart photo albums. We can upload photos if we choose to, we're not going to there. Um, but with that quick file folder creation there, this allows us to create those prerequisite uh, folders that have the right photos in it of certain people. Indeed, when it comes to people, we have photo recognition, we have the means to identify faces. So for example, this is Morgan. He, here he is in several different albums. And what we can choose to do is name him there. So we can go ahead and click Morgan. 
and boom, now all of those photos of Morgan are tagged, but moreover, the future files that I upload to different albums that have got Morgan in them will be recognised. Obviously, nothing is perfect. For example, there's a picture of me there at the top left wearing sunglasses and a hat, but then there's me down here in another photo. So what I can do if I choose to is merge it with the other one and now it will continue to merge those and again I can do the same thing again there merge it with Robbie and boom I've now merged all of those photos of me but what's really useful is if I'm looking for certain presets so say I was looking for a photo of me and Morgan I can just go ahead and write Robbie Morgan search and it will find the photos that had me and Morgan in them so that's quite a useful um, setting there within that AI supported photo stuff there where it falls down a little bit, and I'm sure a number of you know, is the previous version, DSM 6.2, had two different photo apps. It had Synology Moments, and it had Photo Station. Now, Photo Station was kind of like the business end, and a lot of that has been built in. Stuff like uh, creating the shared space, the personal space, creating those tailored out um, um, uh, sharing configuration rules. If you want, if you're, say, a photo, uh, um, you know, a wedding photographer, or someone that sells your media and uh, wants to let people preview images, you can do that within Synology Photos. A lot of security stuff as well built in. And you you know it's a nice configurable outset that you can do for a lot of the configuration options that are built in there and a lot of the settings that were in photo station are present here and you know they're all available they're all kind of configurable you can create permission rules and stuff like that but they're not fantastic they weren't as detailed or uh, as meticulous as photo station had them and i think this idea of synology keeping things as simple as possible has annoyed some users that like to have a lot of those configuration settings that are in photo station and as for the ai supported stuff although synology have upgraded a lot of the features in photo station since it's launched in dsm7 for its you know for the better increased you know support of heic and some of the hevc stuff i will argue that they've removed some of the key interesting aspects of Synology moments when it comes to AI um, analysis and recogn uh, recognition of photos. We have face recognition, but it's removed thing recognition. In Synology moments, you could identify food, drink, trees. You could. It was smart enough while analysing with that AI algorithm to identify things. And if you wanted to search for photos of landscape, photos of parties photos of specific foods you could do that that is not a feature that's in synology photos right now and no one really understands why it's not there when you can still do it in moments it's still able to scrape the metadata for uh localized information so you're able to find locations and get photos from a specific location all in one place so again, all of these three different photos from different out, uh, two different albums, three photos all in one place, and it is able to crawl that metadata, but still nonetheless, not having those features that were in Moments and Photo Station has certainly annoyed a few people there. And I think of all of the key first party apps, and the Photo Station, uh, sorry, Synology Photos does have a lot of different features and services, specifically the smart album creation, I really, really like. But still nonetheless, and even the sharing rules too, you know, let's talk about those sharing rules. A lot of those are pretty detailed and good as well. It's still not as good as it could be. And I think uh, Synology Photos has still got a way to go before it can outpace moments in Photo Station. But with other applications with regards to multimedia, Synology does bring it forward somewhat. So, for example, Audio Station is the means to manage your um, audio media. There is an app um, on the Synology Application Center there for both uh, managing your iTunes server. So you can have an iTunes server that can communicate with your iTunes services and your Mac services to play that music. And there's also uh, a standard media server application um, that allows you to uh, manage DLNA and have media on your application be accessible from your smart TV, your consoles, and whatever. Um, but what makes um, Audio Station stand out is although not a lot of people are ever going to be playing their music from this interface, because very few people play it, you know, this is back to the days of Winamp and stuff like that. What it does have is a great service and support for things like Smart Home and in particular um, Alexa and um, uh, the likes of Amazon Fire Stick. Much like the Photos application, there is apps on uh 
the Amazon marketplace to enjoy your media natively with Synology apps. And that goes for the video application and the media applications. And with support of um, Alexa on um, audio station that is very very beneficial to a lot of users that want to be able to connect their Alexa to their Synology library so they can ask the Alexa play the uh, music of Queen and then it accesses not uh, Amazon's own music catalog it accesses your music on your NAS via voice command that's something that no other NAS brand provides in the first part you can use tools like my media to get the job done but Synology is the only one that includes that feature in their platform so moving forward from that let's talk about video because the Synology Video Station application is pretty darn good. It is a great alternative to third-party ones out there. Um, it's not perfect, but I will say if you want to enjoy your media with uh, native access to the hardware, so again, that goes to transcoding engines and stuff like that, it's all built in there. And it allows you to play this media, find information about it, and when you are playing files, and I'll show you in just a moment, you can configure a lot of that playback. So if we go back, we'll go back to the movie collection there, and we'll go, for example, with Pulp Fiction. We can go ahead and play that file there. We've made sure to keep things muted. And then from that, you can go ahead, flick forward into the, the media. Go for that there. Let's not get ourselves copyright banned or uh, kind of uh, break any rules there with YouTube. I chose a terrible film to show this off, didn't I? Um, but with this... You can enjoy the movies both on your multimedia platform and here in the web browser. And again, you can do picture in picture and have it in the bottom right. And there's lots of options there for managing the metadata and scraping from like the movie database and more. All of that being configured inside. It is a great application and it is a nice first party alternative to a Plex Media Server without having to pay a Plex Pass. But what I will add when you are trying to enjoy multimedia on this. Um, if you're not using the scraping of metadata and you want to, it's a little bit convoluted to add that service. Unlike Plex, where it's inhibit, it, it's built in, you need to go ahead and create a, a Google API connection to add that service. It's a few rings. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a bit of a hassle to set up. But once it's done, it is playable. But most users will want to use a Synology NAS for Plex Media Server. And that is one of the main things um, that I think... To the detriment, maybe, of some of the newer generation Ryzen based uh, systems from Synology that don't have integrated graphics. Um, I know this is about DSM, but it is worth highlighting that your Plex Media Server experience on a Synology NAS will differ depending on the uh, NAS you are using. So, for example, there we've got the matrix. It's scraped all that metadata. That's all been done automatically within Plex. Do bear in mind that if you do want to take advantage of a lot of the hardware attributes, um, such a, with uh, hardware-enabled conversions and transcoding, uh, then in those scenarios, you are going to have to get a Plex Pass, which is paid for. Indeed, Synology, obviously prioritizing their own video station application, do allow uh, installation of Plex, but it's still listed as a beta application, and the installation of Plex is by no means as um, seamless as other applications there on the NAS. Um, Alongside Plex, you can also run MB, of course, another application that is available in the App Center. If you go to the third-party ones, you scroll to the bottom, they still allow MB as a non-beta app, something I find really, really strange. Um, but still, DSM does not interfere with these and does allow you to play your multimedia, your music, your whatever, nice and easily there with both of the respective applications alongside Synology's own application running tremendously well there. I recommend it. But... When it comes to multimedia on this device, whether you're utilizing those first-party applications or one in the App Center, or you are using Jellyfin, yes, we have a video coming up on that very, very soon. Multimedia enjoyment on the Synology NAS is a very diverse thing, and you're able to do it in a number of different ways, whether you want to go first-party or third. So DSM does not limit that, and DSM 7.1, if anything, has made the process a little easier with installing some of its first-party applications and certainly the integration between some of the other tools out there. So again, I can't fault DSM for their multimedia support. I just find applications like Synology Photos have, if anything, taken a little bit of a step back compared with other apps on the DSM 7.1 and hopefully in the future DSM 7.2 lineup.
Now, I mentioned Docker there when I was talking about Jellyfin there, and it's worth highlighting that DSM also includes the means to create and uh, support and kind of host virtual machines. Now, that can be broken down predominantly into two main categories. Uh, there is a virtual machine manager that we sort of alluded to a little bit earlier on, and of course, Docker there, depending on the level of complexity and kind of native, low-level uh, or I should say high level but low layered access to the hardware inside. So Synology doesn't have its own container application like some of the NAS brands out there, but it does use Docker, probably one of the, if not the most popular uh, Docker and container uh, uh, container application in the market. You can have access to the registry to download applications on the fly. So if you wanted to use the Plex Media Server container, which will give you a greater degree of access to the hardware in your NAS, you can do that there and then install them at a simple click. So say we go for um, um, OpenVPN, we go for one of those ones there we can go ahead and again Synology has its own VPN management tool built in as well but you can choose to go ahead and install these very very easily the configuration options and different repositories can be added very quickly and as it's a third party application I'm not going to go into too much detail in this DSM 7.1 review uh, an overview but it is very user friendly it's very easy and can be set up and with apps being deployed and launched very easily there nice and simply um, but the real magic comes from Virtual Machine Manager here. Now, there was a time a few years ago when I felt like Synology's Virtual Machine tool was by no means ahead of anyone else. I think QNAP's Virtualization Station, incredibly diverse there. Synology Virtual Machine Manager has closed the gap substantially, not with other NAS, not just with other NAS brands, but of course with Hyper-V and VMware with incredible integration with those. Deploying a virtual machine on this uh, custom is very very easy i've created a vm in here the only reason i've not turned it on is because right now i need a lot of the system resources to run a lot of the things we're doing right now so to put it into perspective i'm going to power on that vm now and show you the main problem because i'm using this nas right now uh which is a uh, dual core four thread processor the r1600 inside the ds93 plus and that is going to make a hell of an impact on the overall system resources memory sharing and stuff is available here but if we connect with this vm it opens up in a new portal there and again you can tap into this um, utilizing uh, a lot of uh, native uh, vm access uh, command tools that's a windows vm there uh, oh, i think a windows storage server vm there and you can use remote connection uh, for windows to tap into that without using a web browser which will lower um, uh, the frame rate there and increase the latency quite substantially but again, when you are running a VM in DSM, there is elements of resource sharing and you can assign virtual uh, CPUs using the threads of the CPU. But again, you're going to need a more powerful Synology NAS to really enjoy this application. What is really cool is when you want to connect with those existing um, uh, providers of images that you're creating on the fly for uh, VMware and um, a Hyper-V which can all be patched into the system and you can manage multiple VMs all throughout this tool very very easily. Now if you have an existing USB image of uh, a backup perhaps you have of a system image of a Windows machine you can connect it via USB and then mount it as an available image either as a disk image of a USB or as an ISO or you can run a virtual version of Synology as well within the system to run within the virtual machine environment. This is something that taps in a lot into that active backup application that I mentioned earlier on. Now, it you know when it comes to having a, a failover, the failover carryover for a virtual machine, um, a third-party virtual machine into it is still very, very good. Um, I will say one of the features the Virtual Machine Manager does not have built in, and again, this is another one of those applications that could, if I really delved into it, be longer than this whole video. But one of the features that it doesn't have that I wish it had is the means to download VMs directly from the interface. What I mean by that is we've seen a lot of virtual machine tools whether they be from other nas brands like again virtual virtualization station or third party non nas associated ones like virtualbox that allow you to download ubuntu vms download windows 7 8 10 and even 11 vms directly onto the nas for quicker vm deployment that is not a feature that's available here i wish it was even a vm store and it doesn't have to go as far as downloading OS level VMs, open WERT, um, 
different uh, router or uh, firewall or management applications, even open home or IoT um, uh, I, um, downloadables would be quite nice. They've supplied that feature in Docker because that's native to Docker. That is a third party application. But not having that within the virtual machine, not having a registry or repository to download images from, it's just a little bit of a shame. I know business users probably wouldn't take advantage of that, but I think home users would appreciate that. But outside of that, the virtual machine management within Synology DSM 7.1 is still very, very good. And if you do want to configure them on the fly and um, uh, kind of change them, obviously you have to power them down, whether you want to power them down safely or just go nuts and uh, download them, uh, sorry, uh, uh, close them down very very uh, sharply that is all something you can do within this interface you can even attach usb ports that are on your synology NAS to the vm and the configuration is there i just think it's still more business than i think pleasure and all of those options and all of the management is configurable and accessible at all times via that interface but let's carry on Actually, in hindsight, I was probably doing it something of a disservice there because as soon as I was about to move on to the next section, I realized I did overlook some of the benchmark features there. So I thought I'd add this addendum. First and foremost, there is the option, of course, of the uh, the Synology Guest tool. It allows you, uh, when you're installing, say, a Windows VM, to have Synology's own tool, which has a lot of drivers and background stuff to make the fluidity and um, deployment of a virtual machine significantly easy that you can go ahead and download to have for your VMs. Indeed, the same thing goes for protection and retention policies. So, Because you can, if you choose, create a, a routine of snapshots of a VM. So if you are running a VM and eventually you hit a wall with an up, uh, software update, which is one of the reasons a lot of people use VMs, by the way, to test out certain updates in a virtual environment, you can create a retention policy that creates snapshots for you to roll the VM back later on when you need it. Although, this is where we do see some of the stuff with a more professional license needed for, say, off-site virtual, uh, virtual machine snapshots. And if you go to the license area, you can see that there are other licenses out there that require certain features in order to be activated. So, for example, if you want to take advantage of some of the high availability settings where VMs are spread across different nodes... These are things that are locked behind some of the pro license and not included with the free license you get with the system by default. Deploying a virtual machine is very straightforward and you can export the VMs over from another system very, very easily. Although I will highlight, as you can see here from this VM I've imported over, that it is um, carried over, let's get that VM cluster, that the VM that I exported over from my 15.2.2 and my entire configuration that I carried over to the 9.2.3 for this video, hence why I needed to upgrade the memory, some of the names haven't carried over there. So again, do bear that in mind if you're carrying stuff over. It's not a problem. It's still kept all of the protocols and the setup there. But let's go for our virtual machine creation if we want to create a brand new one. We've got our options there. We can create that virtual DSM or use uh, third-party ones there. But say we go for a Windows VM there, we can go ahead, select the one that we're going to be going for there. Again, we can give it a name. We'll call this test VM2. Again, you assign the number of uh, how many CPU cores it's got. But again, remember, you can use virtual uh, cores there for threads. Click one. Again, how much memory you want to give it, give it one gig of memory. Uh, what kind of visual output we're utilizing. Bear in mind, you're not able to use an HDMI output on this NAS, uh, or the majority of Synology NAS is at that. And again, we can go ahead. Oh, you may have missed it there. I know I did. You can assign virtual machine priority. That means if you've got multiple VMs and resources are getting tight, you can make sure that the right VMs get a lot of that attention when they need it. Um, again, how much space this VM is going to have, you can assign it there. And again, you can choose what kind of storage. And again, that may make a difference based on the VM you're using, what storage controller you should use. There's a lot of configuration. And as you saw there, the guest tool is where that really comes in handy there. Whether you want to create a sub or new network for the virtual machine or use the existing network so you can communicate with actual bare metal devices you can do. If you have an ISO um, for installing a Windows VM, so in my case, I've got a selection of images here that are all ISO based. I can put the Ubuntu one on there if you wanted to run a Linux VM. But again, all of these are ones that I've put on the system. They weren't included. Um, 
And then from there, use the guest tool. You can choose whether you want to use virtual USB or whether you want to use the USB devices on the system. As you can see, one of them is already occupied, but I can assign the other VM to or the other USB to the VM. And it is very, very customizable there. And again, if we don't put the ISO, we can go ahead and just run it on standard command line, uh, which is not useful if you're not going to put an image in there to boot from. Um, but again, if you're using a USB drive with an image on it, you can still access it if you assign the USB to the VM. And again, you can say which USB users or which uh, which groups or users can access the VM. So again, we'll use our lovely friend Clive we created earlier on. And that's it. You can create it and choose whether to power it on. I'm not going to power it on here because obviously the resources were already getting eaten up by our existing VM. But that's how easy it is to assign a VM on there. So I know I was a bit downer on this application because of the inability to, uh, to have a registry or a repository for VMs. And some of the licensing stuff for the high-end business stuff Although annoying is, I would argue, acceptable at that tiered level of reliability and dependence on this system. But overall, the virtual machine tool is still better than it's ever been in 7.1. And I know 7.2 is integrating new features that roll in with existing C2 applications and uh, existing uh, active backup stuff. They're all melded together for a great ecosystem there for virtual deployment. Next up, let's discuss the Synology Collaboration Suite again. Synology and DSM has always been kind of a champion of the single ecosystem and very early doors, one of the things that Synology made a big, big noise about was their means to create their own alternatives to existing popular third-party applications. By that, what I mean is, when you are using the Synology to store all of your data, and if you're going to wrap your business around it, you've now got a lot of applications that can replace those from Google, from Microsoft, and more to allow a complete one first party ecosystem there. So for example, if you are using things like Google Mail or OneDrive, what you can use is Synology's own email applications and they have two of them. One, to synchronize existing email accounts uh, from you know known or lesser known third parties, or you can create your own email server on the Synology Now system. <coughs> so for example, you have Synology Mail Plus. I've not installed these, but again, these are the ones that allow you to um, work with other uh, email servers, including the Synology Own. And of course, you can utilize MailStation to create a webmail service on your own existing device. And again, these can work with your own independent email server or synchronizing with third-party ones that I've not set up for this video. Again, that is a whole bigger video and requires a lot of domain registration and more. Now, alongside that in the collaboration suite, what you've got after, of course, Synology Drive, let's not forget Synology Drive that's running on our own client systems and apps, what you also have is, of course, things like NoteStation. Now, NoteStation runs on mobile devices. You've got the app for it for your phone. You've got the client application for desktop systems. And it is a synchronized note application that you can, you know, copy and paste stuff information to, keep a backlog, to-do lists and more. And all of these things that can be directed towards individual users or shared team uh, notepads and note stations there that everyone can work within for deadlines and more. You can set alerts, reminders, and all of that stuff all built into that application there. But it gets even better because another thing you have with the device is Synology Chat. Now, Synology Chat serves as an alternative to things like WhatsApp and Skype. It's available for mobile and with a desktop application, as you can see here. And with that desktop and mobile application, what it also allows you to do is to create little team groups that can all communicate, send files to one another, share links, and all of them can be completely separate. There's everything from emoji handling there all the way through to uh, security settings, um, and, you know, HTTPS and encryption, and allowing lots of users to be able to communicate all within that private network. And all of that's included. It is its own first party and dare I say premium communication service. I don't think it gets anywhere near the respect it deserves. And again, this is something I'm probably gonna revisit in a new video soon, because again, I've not talked about chat for a few years, but it has improved exponentially. And now they've integrated a lot of the other features of the collaboration suite, particularly Drive. It's allowed a much more seamless and integrated communication system within DSM 7.1. And again, no other brand gives this. A lot of the other brands either roll in things like Skype and WhatsApp, which is all good, 
But I like the fact that when you buy the Synology, you're getting that collaboration suite built in. And again, it extends beyond communication as well. What we can see as well is things like contacts, where you can synchronize your existing address book and then integrate that into your email server, integrate that into your chat server, and then create that network as well, whether you're using third-party downloaded TSVs or uploaded TSVs or creating it on the hoof. And again, it integrates into those other devices where those other applications where you want to integrate it into Drive, into uh, chat, and add those users for that contact within that big, larger in-house network. And again, the chat can be managed very easily with its own control panel there where you can talk about a lot about the history, flagging alerts, things that should or shouldn't be talked about, or get uh, managing users in groups and moving them around on the flight. It's very, very good. Alongside that in the collaboration suite is the option of Synology Calendar. Synology Calendar allows you to either create your own brand new calendar, again, integrating into chat, into Drive, into a contact, into all of the messaging system internally. But you can also integrate third-party calendars as well. So if you choose to, you can go ahead and synchronize in, say, a Google Calendar or a Microsoft Calendar there and integrate them in all of them in there, and again, adding users into those individual groups, all of it being done very, very easily. And again, lots of configuration options, lots that you can play with there as an admin, and the end users still be able to configure this calendar. Again, mobile applications can be integrated into this. So the collaboration suite from Synology doesn't get anywhere near the respect I think it deserves. And particularly when it gets overlooked that there are desktop client applications and the mobile app to allow you and your staff and your team members all to be able to communicate via this private channel all managed by DSM 7.1 on the Synology there. Which brings us to what I think is one of the other big, big, big premium applications that arrives in DSM 7.1 and of course has existed for a while, Surveillance Station. Now, a number of feature that genuinely gets massively overlooked that continues to annoy me is that the Synology DSM platform arrives with a comprehensive, detailed and business class surveillance application. Recently updated to Surveillance Station 9, this application is very, very detailed in what it's able to provide for both home and business users for IP cameras in your home or business environment. Now, let's get all of the good stuff out of the way. First and foremost, accessing your camera feeds via the web browser on this plan on this app is incredibly straightforward right now we've got two cameras set up in my network environment as you can see here i'm going to get that seagull out of the way and as you can see right now while we're running this this has got the camera angle here we've got everything running and it's all running in real time there now what i'll say is what we've got is one camera here at the bottom and this camera here is utilizing um, a zoom in mode there so at the moment it's zooming in there's my shirt and we can come out of that zoom and what we can do if we choose to and remember all of this is in the web browser with the tiniest delay i've got to say if i uh, clap in front of the camera i run about a second and a half delay there what we can do is select a camera and go back in time there so we can go back to an earlier stage of the recording there and as you can see now if i put my hand up in front of the camera the bottom camera there is showing uh, now, whereas the top camera is showing the past there. And we can do that in real time. And if we choose to, we can go ahead and create another zoomed in portion. And if we like, what we'll do is we'll zoom in on that camera screen there. And we'll move that one into its own block. And again, we can do that and just do picture in picture and start adding more and more uh, blocks available to us there that we can update into the layout and in kind of enhance these into other areas of the camera stream there sorry if i keep looking at the camera now you may notice that a couple of the feeds there are blank now part of that is to do with the um busyness of the network and also the output that i've selected i've selected a particularly high-end output for that but if I was to lower the stream quality, we would be able to see that if we go to some of the lower uh, qualities there. But we don't need to do that either because what we can do is open up the client. There is a desktop client application here that you can see here on screen. Again, I should still be in the bottom corner there. Now, with this desktop client, you have a greater degree of access. It's using the CPU and memory of your local system. And now we can see all of my notes here on the table. We can see the coffee that I've got on the go. And we've got all of those feeds there all happening from a camera that I've got much higher up. And indeed, as that camera is a pan tilt zoom camera, we can bring it up a little bit and it will zoom that camera up there. So we might be at the defining point of that camera. Um, but 
With this layout here, we've got a number of very cool options. So for example, again, as mentioned, what we can do is zoom in. So if we zoom in to the desk there, we'll have that. What we can do is now go back in time to earlier on in the video in that feed as shown earlier on while I'm talking and waving my hands around all over the place. But what we can also do is go back to the night when no one was here and the, and the building was empty and there was nothing on this desk. And that can be extended quite far with the timeline at the bottom with things like fast search and particularly when you start rolling in some of the newer generation stuff coming into 7.2 with their new AI supported cameras that's going to allow a lot of the deep video analysis stuff that currently is only available on the DVA series from Synology to be made available to systems like the 923 Plus and others because that uh, the DVA stuff, the deep video analysis, is going to be done on the camera side rather than on the NAS and they're all going to be added. You can configure a lot of the applications here. If you have uh, maps created there, and again, let's go back into the user interface. If you choose to, and I apologize if any of the stuff I'm doing is slowing down um, OBS there in the background, it is a drop in frame rate. <clears throat> but what you can do within the settings here, if we close that feed down, and we remove that there and just get rid of it there in the background, we can head into the settings, and then from there, open up the maps mode there if we like. And from there, if we choose to, we can add things like open maps and Google maps as well, but you will need to get uh, a registered service with them. They don't provide these for free, but it allows you to add um, an overview of Google Maps that will then allow you to pinpoint where cameras are on a larger field of environment there. Another lovely little feature that's rolled in to uh, Synology's application there. So next up, while we've got that feed running, we should probably close that on the app client. That's probably not helping. Um, we can have a little look there in the background at some of the other features and services. Because if you go to the App Center, there's actually quite a lot of apps available to you. If you go to the full running there's a lot of features and services. So for example, you can take advantage of edge recording, which will take advantage of SD cards within cameras that we're utilizing. So for example, I'm utilizing, I don't know how well you're able to see that there, but uh, some Rio Link cameras dotted around this environment, which have got SD cards in them, which allow recordings to go both to the NAS and onto the SD card slot there, a lovely little feature. On top of that, if you choose, you can run uh, a live broadcast to uh, YouTube. So if you need to stream a camera very, very quickly, you can add that feature. On top of that, that smart time lapse we mentioned earlier on that allow you to fast forward through rec recording substantially. Um, and again, there are other features and nodes such as live cam that allow you to turn mobile phones into cameras that can connect with your surveillance system. So if you need a surveillance camera quickly, you can enable your phone to be a camera. And therefore, if you are investigating a scene or you need uh, an IP camera that's mobile on you to sort of pop in your pocket, that does allow you to add that. You can also add a number of other IP internet uh, internet protocol uh, devices, not just cameras, with a large number of cameras supported, such as IP speakers, and then IP modules that can be used to activate security doors. And once you integrate that into the deep video analysis to recognize faces, that can be incredibly useful to your surveillance environment. And remember, all of this is included in this app if you've got the sufficient hardware to run it. It's included with your Synology purchase in DSM. When I talk about applications on different NAS platforms, which is the best of the best, although I don't think Synology's photo application or their virtual machine application is the best in the market right now, it's still very, very good, but not the very, very best, their surveillance tool is hands down the best. It's just got the best features, it's user friendly, it's incredibly meticulously laid out, a lot of work's gone into the GUI, and it's faultless in its execution there, at least as far as the user interface is and the management. And the fact that I can do all of this via a web browser and the client app, not just the client app, and with improvements coming to DS Cam uh, from Synology that allow a lot more configuration and control, cannot fault it. With a lot of other client-based applications for verifying recordings and more, all built into the bottom there for business users. Indeed, if we go into individual cameras, that we've got listed here and we open up the camera menu, we can go into that camera that's above my head. And then from there, what we can do is change some of the settings that are quite cool. So for example, I've got a detection area here. And if I wish to, actually I've just realized we're not gonna be able to access that camera via this means because of the heightened, uh, security, uh, heightened uh, stream profile. If we go into the event detection there, we move into the detection area. What we can do is select preset areas of the recording that we want to have alerts on. So if we remove the one that's there, we say, right, I want to know whether someone breaks into this window up here 
there you go now that area is going to be the area of attention for what we are doing and again you can change the sensitivity you can say whether you want the camera to be the one that recognizes motion or the software that will depend on the camera you use on top of that if you like let's save that there don't say you can optimize again some of the camera settings some of the screen qualities there and if you are utilizing some cameras that have got uh, such as HEVC uh, file compression in their recording, you may want to change some of these settings, or at the very least, head into the Synology App Center and download the advanced media extension, which allows um, enhanced support of HEVC media, which only affects Synology internals. It won't affect kind of external multimedia, but it's still a nice option. And a lot of this can be changed, such as the retention policy, such as what, how much of the data is um, kept for a certain period of time before it's overwritten by 24-7 recordings, some of that dual recording we mentioned. And again, with Synology rolling out C2 recording uh, from their C2 platform, which allows you to uh, record to the NAS and to the cloud in case someone breaks in, smashes the camera, that can be quite beneficial. And again, all of that is configurable inside. And there are other settings being rolled in one by one in Surveillance Station 9, such as adding watermarks, um, privacy masks and more, all to the um, areas on the camera there. So again, all of this stuff is available to you by default on the settings of the camera. So why on earth could I have anything bad to say about this application? Well, there isn't that much to complain about. But what I will say is the fact that most, and by most I mean 95% of Synology NASes, arrive with just two camera licenses, that's really disappointing for me. I don't like that I've only got two camera licenses. Now, it is a premium application. I appreciate it needs to have updates. It needs to be maintained over time, both in terms of security and indeed features, such as home mode, which I'll talk about in a moment, but only two camera licenses. For a home user, means a camera out front and camera out back. But if you're a business, you have to spend between 30 and 50 quid to add a camera each time. Now, there are Synology cameras coming out soon, and we're still waiting at the time of recording whether they are going to include licenses inside, which would make them a little bit more palatable, I think, for many people. But still, nonetheless, only having two camera licenses is one of the very, very few things that lets down Surveillance Station for me, and particularly in version 9. When I mentioned home mode there, that's one of those features that a lot of people don't really cotton on to. It's a means, if you set it up, and you have DS camera on your mobile device, what it allows you to do is have it so that you can have cameras in your home or business that are on but not recording. And the minute your phone breaks the Wi-Fi connection that is the same um, uh, network as the NAS, the home mode recognizes you've left the premises because you've gone out of the Wi-Fi boundaries, and then it turns on all the cameras with your own relevant recording or alert patterns. It's very, very detailed, and I really like that. I don't want you to think that just because of the licensing stuff, I'm down on Surveillance Station. Again, when it comes to a lot of those features and settings, you just can't fault the application. And again, this is in my top five of apps. When I mentioned C2 Surveillance, for example, although that is a premium service that allows you to record on both the cloud and the NAS simultaneously and does require a subscription and or uh, a C2 uh, cloud area of storage, I will say that they do include the means to sign up for a 30-day trial. So again, there are trials, there are means, and it does give you the ability to take advantage and enjoy these features off the bat. Indeed, if we go into the settings menu, there's a lot of configuration you can do by changing the system in the background, adapting some of that storage, which networks it's utilizing, updates, whether you want them to be automatic or not, because of security concerns. And even in the security area, you can do things like adding a watermark to all of your recordings, which is always good, or you can go ahead and start doing some of that stuff with um, uh, creating those privacy masks. For those that aren't aware, privacy masking is when you go into a particular camera or feed, as you can see those watermarks have now taken effect, and we can go in, edit the camera, go into our security settings and enable a privacy mask. And that means certain areas that you might not want to be seeing, whether it's faces or different areas, such as if I wanted to hide the documents on my table, which by the way, are of literally no interest because they are scribbled notes, then you can go ahead and enable that privacy mask and that will cover that area throughout the recording. So it's features like that. I understand that Synology want to roll in and make sure are maintained within their system and services over time. And ones that I feel 
um, do benefit the platform as a whole, but it's just only having those two camera licenses when some brands are offering four and even eight licenses with their surveillance platforms. And when you really roll in those additional costs, it all adds up quite significantly. But that is it. That is DSM 7.1 running on this 923 Plus. And overall, as I've always said in my videos, it is a fantastic application and it is still the score to beat when it comes to NAS storage and NAS software. Synology have always prioritized the software over the hardware. And I think a lot of the time, and I hope this long, long, long video has indicated just how much of that is true. It is not a perfect application. Some well-versed IT users may slightly dislike the oversimplified nature of some of the options, hiding some of the difficult ones from them. There are certain features that are coming in 7.2, such as um, full volume encryption and support of write once, read many, and other innovations and improvements on a number of the applications that we've talked about that will cover in a much smaller form version when DSM 7.2 comes around. But until they come along, DSM 7.1 is still not perfect for most users there. Some of the stuff to do with licensing may put you off, and I would say a lot of users that are coming to Synology still prefer some third-party applications over a number of their offerings. But you cannot fault the collaboration suite. You cannot fault Active Backup, Surveillance Station there, SANS the license. You can't fault the myriad of ways in which you can back up and synchronize your data. And you just can't fault the security and the usability of the DSM platform, even in version 7.1. And I still happily recommend it in 2022 and 2023 moving forward. Thank you so much if you did watch this whole video beginning to end. I reckon maybe one of you did. And if it was you, let me know in the comments. But apart from that, I hope you've enjoyed this review and overview of DSM 7.1. It's been a big, big video with a lot, planning, a lot of planning behind it. And I hope you've enjoyed it. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Click like if you've enjoyed the video subscribe if you're going to get yourself a Synology NAS in future or you're still not too sure about which one you're going to go for and you need more information moving forward and if you need a helping hand use the free advice section link below over to NAS compares there's a free advice section manned by me and Eddie the web guy the two people that run NAS compares it's just us or if you want some community support go to ask NAS compares the free community forum link below which again is me Eddie and a bunch of other people in the NAS community that can help you out and finally very important if you found this video helpful and if you were planning to buy a Synology now from Amazon anyway, that's really important. If those two things are true for you, please use the links in the description to take you there. Anything you buy on Amazon via those links will result in a small sum of money going back to me and Eddie that help us do what we do as Amazon Associates. Use it if you're going to buy from Amazon anyway. It doesn't cost you anything and it helps us keep doing what we do. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.